Hi, my name is Mustafa Kyol. I'm a senior fellow at the Cato Institute in Washington, D.C., uh, focusing on Islam, modernity, and public policy. I'm also a contributing opinion writer for the New York Times. Uh, today, I'll have a conversation with my colleague, Fleming Rose, who also is a senior fellow at the Cato Institute and a prominent Danish journalist. We will talk about a new poll in Denmark on attitudes about free speech and society, including various groups in society, including the Muslim community. Uh, before that, let me remind why the discussion in Denmark is interesting and important. Uh, 15 years ago, the world has seen the cartoon crisis in Denmark, the so-called. Um, it began when Jillian's Post in a newspaper published a few cartoons of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. This angered some Muslims, some of them which called for censorship, and a few of them reacted violently, unfortunately. Uh, now, I must remind that Fleming was then the editor of Jillian Poston, which may irk some Muslims you know, who might be watching this video. But I met him over the years, and, and I, I realized that he published those cartoons really not to denigrate Islam or to offend Muslims, but really to uphold free speech, uh, which is a universal value that we all need. And uh, I've also seen him defend uh, the rights of Western Muslims against far-right politicians who want to expel Muslims from Europe or who want to uh, oppress their rights and, and their free speech. Therefore, I believe, his, I believe that his perspective is really important for both Muslims and, and his fellow Western Europeans and others to hear. So therefore, let's have a conversation. Uh, well, hi, good morning, Fleming. How are you? Good morning, Mustafa. While it's not morning here in Copenhagen, it's in fact... Uh, yeah, sorry about that yeah, confusion, but uh, happy to see you. Uh, so thanks for your time for this. Now, first of all, please help us understand. I mean, what about this new report? There was a new report commissioned by the Danish government on attitudes about free speech. There was also a poll uh, included with that. And you were in the commission who uh, ultimately drafted or helped draft this report. Can you tell us about it itself and some of the important findings? Yes. You know, for, for the past 15 years, we've had a very heated discussion in Denmark about free speech and its limits <clears throat> in the aftermath of the cartoon crisis. And in, in the spring of 2016, um, Parliament passed a very, I think, problematic law targeting Islamists and uh, passing a law. It was in the aftermath of, the, of, of a documentary shot with a secret camera on, on, on Danish public t television. And in this documentary, um, some Muslims and especially some imams um, condoned you know, bigamy and, and violence against women uh, uh, and, and social cheating. And there was a big debate and uproar. And in the aftermath of this episode, Parliament passed a law criminalizing the condonance, condoning of, of, of some crimes uh, in a religious setting, <clears throat> which I think is non-democratic in the sense it was discriminating, you know, against believers. If I was saying the same as an imam uh, in a public space, uh, in parliament or in a public debate, I would not be prosecuted because it was not a religious setting. And, and in the aftermath of this debate, uh, the then Minister of Justice decided to commission a report on the state of free speech. And, and we've been working since uh, the spring of 2017 and the 800 pages report was just uh, uh, published. There were 11 people from different you know, parts of society involved in this uh, work under the auspices of uh, the Ministry of, uh, of Justice. And the poll you referred to in your introduction was part of our work. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's interesting here, let me underline that uh, you'd also opposed a law in Denmark, which was specifically targeting the free speech of religious people, especially Muslims. Yes. Uh, because, you know, they might have some conservative opinions that may be shocking for Danish society, 
but they had the right to say that as well, and you defended that right. Yes. So that's important to, for Muslims to realize that this is a this is a value we all need. Exactly, and I'm 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 appalled um, because. You know, in the middle of the 20th century, we had a similar discussion with extremist views in Denmark. You know, uh, the Danish Communist Party that was loyal to Moscow, the Soviet Union represented a threat to Denmark and, and Western Europe. And we didn't ban, uh, you know, the Communist Party. They were allowed to sit in parliament. They had their own unions. They had their own schools. They had their own newspapers. And, and I'm not comparing, you know, ideologies here, but we also have a, had a debate about uh, uh, Nazism and, and fascism, and we decided not to ban these ideologies. So I think we, in fact, have a valid experience how in a successful way to, to, uh, to combat uh, extremist opinions without uh, banning them. Mm -hmm. But I remember you telling me that at some point the communists could get a free pass because they were secular. <laughs> Is that correct? I mean, you see that? I, I, I mean, you, when, when I'm trying to understand why, why didn't we ban the communists and why are we banning some uh, 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 Muslim speech? Uh, I think it has to do with a difference in culture that, 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 that communists, you know, they are, they are drinking beers, they are uh, wearing the same kind of clothes. Uh, they, Even though they are anti-democratic and want to uh, circumvent uh, uh, democratic institutions, uh, they, they, they look and talk uh, more or less in the same way as, uh, as other Danes do. While, while, you know, Islam and, and Muslim communities, they seem strange in many ways, uh, not only in 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 our own understanding of, uh, of of their religion and 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 the set of ideas they are committed to, and I think that has this has something to do with. I think it's about fear, you know, and and an an enemy image that are being reinforced with uh, by 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 diversity of cultures. So the principle of freedom sometimes can be curtailed by bias against people who don't look like us. And that can be in the West, that can be in the Muslim world for sure, that can be in India, it can be elsewhere. So it's important to have an objective. I, I, I think that is, I mean, that is um, the fundamental insight if you look at the history of free speech. It is, yeah, exactly. it is, it is always easy to support free speech for yourself or for like-minded people, but it's the, it, the, the difficulty is to extend that right to people with whom you disagree. As George, George Orwell once said, if free speech should mean something, it has to imply the right to say what people don't want to hear. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And can you please tell us a bit more about exactly the, part, the opinion poll? And uh, because there's a discussion about it, I read in the Danish media, in the English language media, it turns out that the Muslim community in Denmark, my co-religionists, uh, were one of the groups, or maybe the, the most uh, visible group, that had a problem with accepting free speech. Is that correct? Is that the right way to put it? Yeah, that's one way to read it. You know, I'm not a sociologist, uh, so I will be careful. You know, reading too much into these figures, uh, but 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 that's 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 one conclusion I think that you can draw. You know, if you if you ask, this is a representative sample. And and uh, people with a background, I think it's from Lebanon, Somalia, uh, Turkey, um, and Iraq. Maybe I don't remember the last group, but they 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 represent the largest Muslim communities in Denmark. And there is a comparing um, uh, sample on on uh, Vietnamese and uh, people from Sri Lanka who are also immigrants, but they are not Muslims, to see if this has something to do with the immigrant experience or if there are other factors. And, and it turns out that, 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 that uh, uh, people with a Muslim background, uh, they, which is quite unnatural, I think, they are, they are willing or they are willing to support um, uh, banning criticism of Islam to a far higher degree than the population at uh, large. 
I think it's 76%, while it's 18% uh, among the population at uh, large. Mm -hmm. And when you ask the same question about who is in favor of, or should people have, a, have the right to agitate for the introduction of Sharia law in Denmark, I think the answer among uh, the Muslim population is 59%. Uh, which means that you have a higher degree of Muslims being in favor of banning criticism of Islam than being in favor of uh, of supporting the right to agitate for Sharia law, while it's exactly the opposite uh, uh, in the population at, uh, at large. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, of course, I mean, the Western uh, Muslim experience is quite diverse. I mean, as, as you also know, I mean, uh, I have over the years noticed, I mean, by looking at polls, that uh, Muslim minority in America uh, has taken a bit more liberal stance on various issues, yeah. uh, including gay rights, for example. I mean, the majority of Muslims in America, for example, support gay marriage. I mean, at least they accept the uh, legitimacy of that, for example. That's not something exactly... Um, How do you explain that? I mean, uh, America, the American experience, I think, has been different in the sense that it is a nation of immigrants. You know, everybody's from somebody, and so somewhere even a few generations before. Muslims have felt, uh, integrated better to the broader society. You don't see, like uh, in France, you know, like suburbs and places that Muslims are, uh, some Muslims are there. I mean, in, in terms of social sciences, use the term ghettoization, cultural like you live in a cocoon, that doesn't, that didn't happen that much in America. It's easier to integrate into society. Also, uh, I think in Europe, I mean, I don't think that's valid for Denmark, but in France, in Belgium, some of the harsh secularity, uh, laicite, hasn't helped uh, integration. I mean, wearing a hijab, a headscarf can be a stigma uh, in France. That's not the case in Anglo-Saxon <clears throat> countries, uh, including US, Canada. So. Uh, that, that, that is, I think, important. Plus, I think that uh, there's a social background, too. I mean, most uh, Muslims who came to America came as uh, professionals coming from a bit maybe more modernized or educated parts of their society, whereas most uh, uh, Muslims who came to Western Europe came from the more traditional uh, parts of their society and they preserved their, their culture. And that, that creates a difference. Mm -hmm. And of course, when we speak of Europe, there is the uh, experience of uh, Muslims in Eastern Europe, countries like Bosnia, Herzegovina, Albania. When you look into Kosovo, when you look into those countries, you actually see very liberal uh, Muslim attitudes on, on many issues, which would, I'm sure, include free speech, but other issues as well. So it's a diverse experience, I mean, and and and... Uh, you want to say something? Sure. No, I, I, I just want to ask you if you think it has something to do with deference to authority, because from, from the poll that we did, I think there is another interesting uh, trend that if you ask, do you think citizens should have the right to say whatever they want if it involves offending other people? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, not not Islam, especially. Then you would also see the the, the Muslim population being an outlier. And also, if you ask, should you, should you have a right to say whatever you want if it represents a threat to social cohesion of society at large? Also, uh, a majority of uh, Muslims say no. Uh, and the same goes for threats to national security. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that, uh, that, that, that more Muslims believe that you should not have a right to say whatever you want if it represents um, a threat to national security. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not only, you know, when you ask about Islam, I think yeah. one way to read this would be a greater def uh, deference for, for authority. Uh, that's mm -hmm. a, at least one way to read it. I don't know what, what's, what's your associations. I mean, I, I think in more traditional societies, there is uh, the idea that, you know, authority should be less questioned for stability, for values, for sacredness, which I'll talk a little bit, talk about in, in, in a bit. So th th having that transition from a more traditional society to a more modern open society is a transformation and it doesn't happen overnight. And uh, that's why I, I'm also worried about the far-right 
uh, movements in Europe who look at these polls and saying, oh, Muslims are a little bit less appreciative of free speech. So let's ban, you know, Muslim immigration. Let's expel them. So there's a kind of approach. And I think that will make those societies not more liberal, but only less liberal and, 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 and yeah. diverse. So, and I, I know that you had a uh, perspective on that as well, because I mean, there are people who say, you know, love it or leave it, you know, accept our values are just, you know, the door is right there. But, and, and I think that's counterproductive. Plus you reminded me when we spoke about this a while ago that, I mean, Christians didn't overnight become very liberal on these issues. Right? I mean, it was a, it was a transformation. And, so uh, that Muslims should not be uh, singled out, uh, although they might, some Muslim communities might have illiberal attitudes that needs to be honestly discussed. Uh, so do, do you agree with that? I mean, that the far right is yes, uh, I complicating I the I, I, I mean, I, I think, you know, it's a complicated issue. And I think what has happened in Western societies over the past 30, 40 years, um, uh, social values of society at large have have been transformed at an extraordinary speed. I'm not only talking here about uh, uh, migration, I'm also talking about attitudes towards homosexuality, uh, mm -hmm. the way people live together uh, um, and, 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 and things like that. Uh, and this has happened very, very quickly. And I think there are people who see that as a normative threat to their way of life. And this mm -hmm. is also reflected in attitudes towards migration and, uh, and Islam, even though it's not, not only about, about, about that. And, and, and my, you know, one of my concerns is that I think right now we are observing a radicalization of what you can call the mainstream in, in, in Western Europe that one thing is to have, you know, far right, you, all, you always have on the fringes uh, some weird uh, elements. Uh, you have that in the United States, you have that in, uh, in, in, in Europe. But, but what I see now is that parts of the mainstream, you know, teachers, nurses, uh, retired people who have had, uh, who, have, who have voted for social democrats or or center political parties uh, through their lives are now becoming radicalized in the sense that they don't believe that peaceful coexistence is, uh, is possible and therefore they are in favor of expelling or closing the border or, or uh, whatever it is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, that is a huge threat, I mean, to liberal democracy in the West. And uh, I mean, let me share my thoughts, if you will, a little bit then. I mean, what the Muslim communities should consider about this? I mean, uh, I mean, Muslim communities in the West actually have a difficult situation. I mean, they are on the one hand pressed by little extremist groups, you know, uh, maybe which might have a uh, threat over them. But uh, the far right people, I mean, white supremacists that had attacked mosques, uh, kill people. I mean, it, it has happened in Europe. It has happened in New, even in New Zealand. Uh, so so on and so forth. So it's not an easy time. And but I think uh, the Muslim communities in the West, especially in Europe and in Denmark, as in, uh, as we're discussing right now, I think need to, uh, with their opinion leaders, intellectual scholars, need to have a bit more uh, honest conversation about how are we going to reconcile with these liberal values. Are these merely Western values that are going to corrupt us and we should reject them? Or is there some value in this and maybe we can reconsider some of their attitudes? And I think on free speech, uh, the ten one tension is that in traditional society, you believe in religion, it's sacred, it is received from tradition, from your family, from your society. You believe in it because you don't question it. You, you just uphold it and you can't even imagine it's being questioned, let alone ridiculed or insulted and so on and so forth. And that is a core fact of your life. But when you come to a modern society, an open society, you cannot preserve that anymore. And you have to have this switch to having your belief, not because it is not questioned, but it is questioned and you rationally defend it and, and you 
uh, at least go over it and at least you learn how to cope with people who have uh, negative ed attitudes about it. And, and that transition has taken place to some extent, but not in full. So we, we're, we're seeing that. Um, Muslims will have to accept that, you know, uh, Prophet Muhammad is my prophet, peace be upon him. I have full respect for him. Some people will question things about his life, about his day and age. They might make a cartoon of him. They might, so we, we don't have to like it. We will not like it, some of the things we hear, but that's a fact of life. And, and we should also try to understand how those people are coming from. Uh, Prophet Muhammad, for example, has been accused for having a marriage with Aisha, whose age was, you know, less than 18, you know, let's say today. Well, some people insulted the Prophet based on this. Well, then I would say, well, no, that was a norm of the time. So we should understand that norms change over time. So you should try to develop arguments like this to make yourself at peace with your faith and also to share with society. So that, that, that they need that transition for representing Islam and sustaining Islam in an open society, which cannot be done by threats or censorship, let alone, let alone violence. That is one thing, and that has happened to some extent, but it has to happen more. The second thing is what you alluded to in the beginning, and that is, well, if offensive speech will be banned all over, someone can ban Islam too. I mean, if you read the Quran, there are some passages pretty harsh on polytheists. Uh, and actually, Hertz Wilders, I mean, the Dutch far-right politician, wants to ban the Quran because he says it's offensive or, and, and I know you argued against him. Uh, no, I had a public debate with him in, uh, in, in Denmark, I think back in 2015. And I think, you know, the fundamental values of a free and democratic society is equality before the law and freedom. Uh, and, and my argument with Wilders is that he is willing to violate uh, a fundamental principle of democracy by not extending the same rights to Muslims as to Jews, Christians, and, and non-believers. He wants to ban the Quran. And the, the interesting thing is that he wants to ban the Quran with a reference to the law according to which he has been prosecuted himself for hate speech. And that is the reason why m Muslims should have second thoughts about blasphemy laws and, and hate speech laws because it only takes an election and another political majority to turn those laws against minorities. And if you look at history, this is in fact what has happened. I mean, blasphemy laws and, and hate speech laws are usually not used to protect minorities. They are in fact, in the larger picture, being used to target minorities, dissenters and unpopular opinions. And I think in this context, we can all, uh, you know, take a lesson, listen, a lesson from the American civil rights movement, because the ACLU and the NAACP and some Jewish organizations, organizations you know, throughout the 20th century had to confront the issue, should we insist on hate speech laws in order to protect minorities, or should we insist on free speech for everybody, uh, no matter you know how insulting it is, as long it does, as long as it does not imply incitement to violence or imminent criminal activity. And the ACLU uh, took the principled route, and I think in fact it paved the way to more inclusion of of the black uh, minority in the public space. I, I'm not saying you know everything is fine. It's not. But, but but compared to 100 years ago, I mean, uh, uh, you had the Civil Rights Act, you have, you have had the first black uh, uh, president, you have ended segregation, uh, which was, you know, the law of the land at some point. You were not allowed to marry across uh, racial lines and so on and so forth. So the fact that you do not have hate speech laws to protect minority groups in the U.S. has not meant less rights for those minorities, in fact, quite the opposite. Yeah. And, and, and why, did, why did the American civil rights uh, movement come to that conclusion? Because they had a very bad experience in, in the beginning of the 20th century when the government, uh, you know, uh, 
came down on 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 political minorities who spoke out against World War One and American involvement and 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 hate speech laws or sedition laws were used to silence them. So they were afraid, you know, we might argue for hate speech laws to protect ourselves, but we know from history that those laws can be turned against us at any moment. Mm -hmm. And that history is often forgotten, so it has to be reminded, exactly. Uh, I mean, I, I, referring back to the question of Muslims and how they handle free speech, I mean, I, I'm happy to see some Muslim intellectuals in the West have realized that if you push on banning offensive speech, you might be the target of it. And for example, Jonathan Brown, a uh, professor at Georgetown, he's a Muslim, a convert to Islam, prominent figure in the American Muslim community. He wrote a while ago that, I mean, if we want uh, blasphemy laws, I mean, if you want laws that will uh, ban offensive speech, sorry, he said, well, we might end up being banned because some of our material can be considered as offensive to other religions. And, and uh, I, I had tweeted about that. So there is a discussion going on, I think, in Muslim communities. And uh, it, it's a transition that is happening, but it has to happen more. And I think one thing that might derail, I'm afraid, that transformation is the far right responses who are saying, you know, Muslims out and, and they have no place in Europe. And I think to uh, sustain uh, a, this fine balance here, we need a principled defense of free speech. Like not for one group, not for my side, not people who are dressed up like me or who eat like me or who think like me, but for everybody. And, and well, you're doing that Fleming, so I, I'm, I'm glad uh, that you know, there's a voice out there and uh, happy to be on the same team in that sense. But I, I, think, I think we also had to recognize that this is very difficult. <clears throat> you know, tolerance is a buzzword. Uh, we all want to be tolerant, but but we have to acknowledge that tolerance is very painful and it's not easy. It's not it's not you know it's not it's not a fact of nature. We are not born tolerant or in favor of uh, of free speech. It's something that we had to learn. We had to educate ourselves, and we have to be able to live with the pain that that comes from being exposed to speech and opinions that we hate and and dislike and that that you know that battle is never settled because there are strong forces within human beings who would like to be intolerant or shut down speech that they don't like it's not because they are evil uh, uh, but it's because it is a fact of human nature our instinctive response is you know shut up shut that guy down we don't want to listen to this uh, so, so we, we th th that's why the battle for free speech is never won. Uh, free speech is by definition and tolerance, as the other side of that same coin, is always threatened, uh, I would say. And, and free speech and tolerance are the exceptions in history. They are not the rule. Mm -hmm. And I think we should also remind people, as a lesson, that the more you ban free speech for groups that are really problematic, you're not making them disappear. You're probably making them more radical. They're thinking, oh, the system doesn't allow us. Oh, you see, you know, we need tougher methods. They don't allow, they say it's democracy, they say it's open, but they're banning us. And I've seen that dynamic in radical jihadist groups uh, and far right, you know, uh, groups like white supremacists and so on and so forth. Uh, Precisely to, precisely because they they are dangerous to free society, we should uh, still preserve free speech for them as long as it doesn't come to the incitement of violence, as you, as you put it well. Um, so well, it shows. I mean, this whole the new poll in Denmark and the book uh, and, and study shows that there's a lot to discuss on these issues and uh, lots to dissect. And hopefully, we'll be keeping speaking about this and doing more work on this uh, i very much look forward to it uh, mustafa well thank you. your perspective is important on these uh, issues yeah and i think in islam uh besides the social setting we have issues in jurisprudence uh how to deal with blasphemy and i've written about this but i have a new book coming which deals partly with this issue in which i mean i go over all the stories of people being 
uh, executed during the time of Prophet Muhammad for their blasphemous speech. And I'm showing that it's actually much more complicated. And there were pe people who actually offended Prophet Muhammad and he never did anything against them. He just let them go. And, and uh, so the, the, and the passages in the Quran, the stories in the Prophet Muhammad's life has to be go, uh, gone over because there are Islamic schools, jurisprudential schools, which says blasphemy is you know, punished by death. And, so, and, and some people have acted. You know, All the land in several Muslim majority countries. Yeah, and, and some of those you know, jurisprudential fiqh, uh, rules are as law you know, implemented in about a dozen countries at least. So, there are issues we have to discuss this, uh, but by upholding free speech for everyone, uh, and I think for Muslims themselves too. Well, I think this is all for today, Fleming. It was great to see you as usual. Uh, great to see you, Mustafa, and keep up the good work. Keep up the good work too. Uh, stay safe. You know, uh, let's let's hope everybody stays safe from the virus and and all the political viruses around the world as well. <laughs> Take care. Okay. See you. See you.